In this lesson, we're going to look at accessor and mutator functions, also known as setter and getter functions or set and get functions. In fact, I think that's what I call them the most, set and get functions. So the idea is every once in a while you'll be writing code for a class and you need direct access to the member variables somewhere where you really don't have it. And you think, okay, I need to create a function that allows me to access or mutate a private member variable. I either need to set a value or I need to get a value. Hence the name set and get functions. Well, you can create these functions and sometimes it's necessary. However, you must understand that these functions are dangerous. You have to define them very carefully because they do create a direct avenue to the private member variables. And you might be thinking, well, why don't you make them public in the first place and avoid that problem? That goes against the whole concept of a class, where you want to put the data in the private section of the class to protect it from being modified the way it should not be modified. So let's take a look at some motivation here. Suppose that we want to write a non-member function, multfrax, and it is non-member. It's not scoped as a fraction class function called multfrax that returns a fraction and we pass two fractions to it. Notice that I've passed const reference, both of those. Why? Well, again, reference because we want to avoid the overhead of a copy, const because we don't want the object that we send to this function to be changed. And how am I going to use this? Well, it'll be used something like this. F3 is going to be assigned the return value of multfrax, which is a fraction, and it's going to be the product of the two fractions that I pass in. So what this is doing is emulating this process. F3 is equal to F1 star F2. And you might be thinking, well, why don't I simply just do that? Well, I can't because this operator is not defined for fraction objects. It's defined for the basic built-in types, but not for fractions. Go ahead and try to compile that. It won't. The compiler will say, I don't know how to do this for these kinds of objects. And I'm going to define then a function called multfrax that will do it. Let's see what we need to do. If I'm going to return a fraction, I'm going to create a local object of type fraction called temp, and then I'm going to build that object the way I want to build it. I will assign to temp's numerator the numerator of the left-hand side times the numerator of the right-hand side. Now that's okay, right? Because this multiplication that I'm doing is between two integers, right? Left-hand side numerator, that's a fraction's numerator, that's an integer. Right-hand side's numerator, that's, that's an integer. An integer times an integer is an integer, and I'm going to assign that to temp's numerator, which is an integer, and everything's fine, right? No, <laughs> it's not all right. Remember that the numerator member variable of the fraction class is private. And this is not a member function. So I can't do this. I can't directly access the member variables in this line of code. So what am I going to do? I'm going to create accessor and mutator functions for my fraction class. But I'm going to do it carefully. We've added some functions to the class. We've added get num, get den, set numer, and set denom. So this is going to return the numerator. This is going to return the denominator. So those are accessor functions. These are accessors or get functions. And these are set functions or mutators. Now let's think about this. If I'm going to return the numerator denominator, I'm simply extracting that information to be public. And that seems like an okay thing. So I call them get num and they're going to return the ints. There's no real problem there. What about the set functions? We have to ask ourselves, can the numerator of a fraction be anything? The answer is yes, negative, positive, and zero. What about the denominator? No. The denominator can be negative, it can be positive, but it cannot be zero. And so this is the one function right here that's going to be defined a little bit differently. And notice that I've made it a bool. Why I've done that here in a minute or two. Let's first take a look at the get num function. Okay, here I have it defined in the associated CPP, the implementation file. Okay. Notice again that I have scoped it. It's a member function, and it's simply going to return m underscore numerator. What numerator? The calling objects numerator. If f calls get num, what's that return? It returns f's numerator. 
not anybody else's, f's numerator. This is a very small function. It's extremely small, and it's no mystery. So we're going to do something a little bit different with it here in a minute. Along with the get den function, we're going to do what's called an inline. Now the get den function is defined very similarly, and again, don't forget to scope it. Let's take a look at the set numer. Again, scoped. Don't forget the scoping. I'm going to pass in an integer, and that value is going to be assigned to the numerator. It's a very simple definition. Now what about the set denom function? That's a bit different. I don't want to define this function to set the denominator to be anything that's passed in. What I'm going to do is I'm going to return a bool, true or false. True if it's set, false if it's not set. Under what condition is it not going to be set? Well, let's take a look. I'm going to default my set. That's a temporary local variable of type bool. I'm going to default that to false and return set. Okay? But if the denominator is not zero, I'm going to set set to true. I'm going to assign the past value to the denominator and then again return set. If the parameter is non-zero, then I'll set the denominator to it and return true. If the parameter has been passed a zero value, then I'm simply not going to set the value and return false. Again, let's look at what I mean by inlining. Okay, this is a small function. I'm going to put the definition of that getNum function right there in the definition of the class. I'm going to bring that down right into there and then get rid of this part. I can't have both. I can't have the definition here in line and the definition back in the CPP. If you do that, the compiler will complain it's got too many definitions. So you've got to have it one way or the other. And likewise, I'm going to put the definition of the get den right down there. Okay, now let's take a look at multifrax function again. What happens when we do the following line of code? I'm going to have temp call its setNumer function and the getNumer function and the getNumer function. That way I can access those variables correctly. All right, now what about setting the denominator? I could use it this way. I could do something like if not temp set denom. So what's happening here? This, the set denominator, returns a bool, right? It's either true or false. So if this returns false, meaning I've tried somehow to set the denominator to zero, then I can output a message, an error message, and exit, bomb out on the program. Now you must understand this is one way to handle this situation. There are many different ways to do it. The best way would be using what are called exception handling techniques, but we don't teach that in this course. So this is our best option, I think, at this point. And that's the end of the session on set and get functions. Remember one thing, just because you have a private member variable does not mean that you should have a set or get function for it.